So we're going to get started. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Francis West. Uh, I am the founder of Francis West Co. and uh, very excited to be here today to host the session on reframe inclusion, the art, the principle, and the practice. Uh, we have a ex very exciting panel, even though in the description of the, our panelists, it all listed as they are from the United States of America, but in reality, we actually um, represent multiple uh, nations. So, for example, Stella uh, Lubashore on the um, um, in this meeting is from the great country of uh, Moldova, and Fanny Creeboy actually is from the country of Venezuela, and uh, Mindy is uh, Chinese, uh, so am I from Taiwan. And Kathleen Delgado, even though um, she looks Irish, but uh, she married her husband is from Bolivia and Portugal. So I consider her representing the um, Latin America countries. So again, welcome to this session. Um, the panelists today are actually uh, from different business and also uh, with academia background. And what we hope to do today is to really share with all of you the journey they each have been on in terms of uh, moving the dial of inclusion, especially in the context of technology and also uh, digital innovation from a kind of, from a thinking and also from an advocacy perspective to actual implementation in the um, business world in, in, and also in academia. So what you're going to hear from them are different perspectives. Um, and on their journey and share their lesson learned. And in many cases, uh, the real uh, nuggets of uh, what really will, will become the real essence of moving the uh, inclusion dial in the real world. But before I go uh, into the panelists, uh, what I would like to ask a question of you right now um, and then just so we can keep it more interactive, because a lot of these Zoom sessions that you've been on, I'm sure it's making you cognitively probably a little tired. And so I'm going to pose a question to ask you to put one word that, that comes to your mind immediately when you think about the word, uh, when you think about the word inclusion. You know, if just put it in there and then later on, we can maybe take a look at to what the audience actually, you know, their immediate association of inclusion in the context of this session uh, that come to mind. So with that as the backdrop, what I'm gonna do is ask um, um, my panelists to actually begin to share their uh, perspective. And one of the first question uh, I'm gonna ask all of them is that how do they think about inclusion and how do we intentionally or um, unintentionally create the opportunity to include digital accessibility into the discussion? And as part two of the question is that inclusion actually has been talked about a lot, um, especially in the business world. There is a coming of understanding, but in some cases, it's in the context of a, a pressure point. For example, a lot of the uh, uh, civil rights movement, at least in the United States, are putting a lot of pressure. So what are the things that we really should be mindful and what are some of the tension points that, that creates amongst you know, their work in the, um, in the context of uh, digital inclusion. So I'm gonna um, ask uh, Stella perhaps uh, to give her perspective first. Absolutely, thank you so much for the opportunity and for engaging in this conversation. Uh, a little bit about my background. I come from a world of HR um, and have uh, played a variety of roles that spanned uh, transformation work, spanned strategy development, technology, uh, uh, adoption, analytics. So to me, the world of inclusion and the lens I look at it is through the world of work and the practices and norms that organizations need to create in order to uh, build an inclusive workplace environment for everyone. The biggest opportunity that I see, and of course it's a tension that is uh, creating for HR practitioners just because these are new muscles that we need to build, is the world of inclusive design. 
and how might we bring that human-centric design thinking to the world of work. So if we reflect back on how our experience as consumer changed when a lot of these principles were adopted to design products and design experiences and technology um, and delight us uh, and make us feel industrious and, um, and, and able to intuitively navigate the, that experience. The same type of thinking is time to be brought to the world of work. If we think about exclusionary experiences we have as workers, a lot of those stem from um, underinvestment in uh, the technical uh, solutions. Many times internal systems may not be integrated or may not be as user-friendly since they are um, uh, more of a cost center than investment in the front end experience for the customer or revenue generation. Many times our work spaces are not designed for um, all sorts of abilities and, uh, and experiences. And it's again done to minimize the expense for the organization as opposed to create an environment where we can do our best work, whatever our context and um, uh, circumstances are. So when we think about the opportunities to transform, first of all is thinking about the end-to-end -end journey of us as workers, from the point where we don't know anything about the brand until we discover it, until we decide to join the organization. And even when we come through the threshold, what that experience looks like, do we get opportunities to uh, be developed um, and, and grow our skills? Because that's inclusion from skills uh, perspective. Do we have opportunities to contribute to organizational mission, bigger mission than ourselves? Do we have uh, uh, a team that is inclusive and um, engages us and we feel we have friends at work? Do we feel we're fairly remunerated and paid? Do we feel we have a good relationship with the manager and the um, the, the and aligned in our purpose with organizational purpose. Even when we leave the organization, do we feel we have a connection and do we stay engaged as an alumni or possibly continue to be a shareholder? So that kind of end-to-end -end thinking from the employee journey is really a necessary new lens that HR can really influence and, um, and bring that inclusive uh, design to the, to the world of work. The other opportunity we need to start exploring is thinking differently about the employment value proposition. Many times organizations think, okay, we will um, have a remuneration strategy, we will have benefits offerings, and anything beyond that is pretty much it. Or we will have a, a one size fits all. And not everybody comes to work only for money and only for benefits. People want, uh, depending on their um, life stage and, and personal circumstances, they may want to uh, belong to a community where they can develop their skills. Maybe they want to create, um, uh, leave a legacy behind. Maybe they want to feel proud for the products that the organization produces, or maybe they just want to come and do their work and at five o'clock, check out and focus on some personal uh, life issues. So the more we can creatively think about these offerings and what people come to work for and include that in, into all the decisions we make about their experience, the more we'll be able to create a personalized um, set of offerings and attract the candidates that actually expect that from their work environment. Again, this is gonna create a lot more complexity probably to manage, but I think we have technology, we have analytics, we have data that allows us to do a lot of that personalization. So leaning into that work tech and the, uh, the ways of making decisions differently, observing the patterns of behaviors and then tailoring the offerings from the work environment, the more inclusive we can become as an organization. Well, well thank you so much, Stella. I think, um... You know, one of the things the Zero Project uh, for the past 10 um, plus years has done is really help to raise the awareness globally on how important the topic of inclusion in this context, of course, is people with disability and accessibility. Um, but like you said, for, for those of us uh, who are in the business um, 
environment, and you and I worked in IBM together, and we know that in order to make this real, it will take, like you mentioned, you know, budget and also really a holistic thinking that all the way from not just hiring or preparing um, the, the workplace for people with disability to join, but really think about the entire um, spokes of, uh, for example, in your context, from HR perspective, you know, including the benefits and that taking that the human center, not just, just a uh, phrase, but integrated into program like your benefit program and re recognizing that individual are different, especially post pandemic. I think everybody recognized that we have to respect, you know, we have to meet the employee where they are. And uh, I think people with disability really taught us that their differences uh, is enable us to design an HR system or program or initiative that is truly uh, human first. Um, the next person I'm going to ask is, is Fanny. Um, Fanny, you have spent a lot of time in, uh, in the in, in inclusive design area, and especially on branding, both as academia and also um, as, a, um, as a practitioner in business setting. I would love to hear your perspective, how you, uh, what your perspective of the managing the, the tension is sometimes you know, in the inclusion area, and also what are some of the opportunities that you see that's upon us? Thank you, Francis, um, for the introduction. And I'm gonna build up on what you were just saying and what Stella was just saying, because um, like um, you may know, my background is from design and I'm on a mission to bring design to do and build equity and inclusion in day-to-day -day life. And we do that through brand creation and experience creation. And like Francis said, uh, as an academic and, and, a, and um and a professor. And what the way we do it is by reframing the challenges and always looking at them through a human-centered design lens. Um, and it's similar to what Stella was saying before and how you look at the employee cycle and how you try to solve uh, um, inclusion through every stage of the employment as an experience. We look at brands also as a constellation, as an ecosystem. Uh, it starts with leadership uh, that is based on empathy and clarity. Um, we always go to the core. What is the brand and market insight that we're building on? How do we bring that to life through the employees and operations like Stella was describing? How does that translate into the products and the sales and the services that we provide? Um, how do we partner with others? How, which channels do we use? Which suppliers do we use? Because when we think about being inclusion, bringing inclusion to life in an organization, it has to touch on all those. And, you know, like, like Francis mentioned, I grew up in Venezuela. I've lived in other countries and now in the U.S. And inclusion can come to life and can mean different things in different places. And we really have to stay connected uh, to who we are creating experiences for, so that so it's minimal for them and it's uh, and it's effective for them. And there are um, three ways that we can think about how to create inclusive experiences. One is about access. Are we missing an opportunity internally, externally, of giving people access to what we're doing? The other one is mindset. Um, are there any barriers? Um, that are interfering with um, creating inclusive brands and experiences. And then it's the experience itself. How do we do this? How do we shape the solution? How do we get people um, to really make it their own and come in their own terms? But anyway, the goal overall is, of course, to create equity across age, ability, gender, race. Uh, and even though we're focusing a lot on technology, it goes beyond technology, right? It goes to the physical space. It goes to the words that we use. It works to the gestures that we use. Um, and you mentioned something about intentionality and, and unintentionality. And sometimes people create incredibly ex inclusive experiences unintentionally. And where we need to come in is to identify what's happening, what's working on it, and then see how do we operationalize it um, for everything else. Over well, to thank you. Thank you, Fendi. 
I know that uh, working with you and your team that um, you are very uh, focused on here and now and in, in the moment and capturing, like you said, the experience um, of the day of the of of of, of what's what's relevant of today, right? I mean, because a lot of times we we will be um, thinking or projecting either uh, beyond or actually uh, or behind. And, uh, and the trick of any kind of a branding uh, and also respecting the personal experience is exactly, you know, meet them where they are uh, contextually. And, and from that standpoint, um, I would love to hear from Mindy and that um, beyond technology, you know, I mean, of course, today, here we are, the theme of the, the talk is, is technology. And I, I always say I spent 37 years at IBM being a technologist. But um, what I found through working accessibility and people with disability is taught me that we really have to think human first, and which is the, the intangible element of experience. So, and yet I know that you have done a lot of work in capturing the intangible and then translating that into a business value proposition. We'd we'll love to hear from your perspective. Absolutely. So a little bit about my background. I'm an engineer from MIT. I'm also a designer from a Dutch design school. And I specialize in bringing inclusive design thinking and innovation practices to product teams. So along with Fanny and our other partners around the world, we also created this global inclusion toolkit for developing countries, which we actually just announced um, at the last RightsCon. So a lot of our work is actually in how we can help global corporations and also local startups rethink inclusion and help them apply it to how their teams work together, how they build their products and how they engage with those communities that their products intend to serve. And so when it comes to how we can build more inclusively, I'd say three things. So one, having the tools and processes to put inclusion into practice is one. Next is to have an inclusive design playbook that you can follow. And then lastly, have generational diversity in your product and cross-functional teams. And so when we talk about having these processes and tools that you can put into practice, we're talking about things, say, like the Global Inclusion Toolkit, if you're developing um, products for a developing country, having an inclusive mindset when it comes to design research. So that means when you're trying to get insights about where to move your product, what's the next thing to build in, what's actually meaningful for the people you intend to serve, speak to them, fold them into the conversation. Right, and then also create platforms where you can create rapid research. Um, research, sometimes there's an impression that it takes so long, let's not do it. You know, we don't have time for this. We don't have money for this, but research has come such a long way. There are so many platforms that allow you to reach so many people in just a day and you can get um, so much, so much more richer insights for the way you can build your services and products. And also have diversity metrics, fold that into your practice and your organization in terms of how you talk about success. When it comes to having that inclusive design playbook, in your playbook, you need to have internal procedures and uh, protocols. So making design research and user research a critical part of your development process, um, using design thinking right inside your product development process to make sure you're folding in all types of different roles and stakeholders, even internal roles into the conversation and make these rituals become procedures so they become natural and enforced. Also have inclusive vocabulary, right? When you talk about product and service development, don't call them edge cases, they're stress tests, right? If you fail your stress tests, you're not being very inclusive. Um, also create checklists and make those checklists flexible, not rigid, because this needs to continue to evolve. There's not, you know, one silver bullet, one right way to do it. Um, when it comes to generational diversity in your product teams, it's not generational bias. It's generational representation because with age diversity, you bring along emotional diversity, cognitive diversity, lifestyle diversity, diversity of lived experiences into the fold. And that's just one easy way to just bring in diversity of thought. I think those are three ways you can build much more inclusively. Well, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask um, the people who are not speaking uh, in the audience to go down mute, if you don't mind, because we are hearing some uh, ambient noise. Uh, I said Ilana Mushkin, uh, if you can go on mute, that would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, 
And also, I'm just going to take a break before uh, some of you uh, arrive a little late. Uh, we ask actually uh, the participant to put, give us a word when you think about inclusion, uh, when, you, when you enter this virtual room of ours. Uh, later on, we want to look back and to see if there's any change uh, in your thinking or your association after this session. So if you don't mind, and also use the opportunity as we were talking, uh, if you have any question, you know, just uh, put it posted in the chat room. Uh, so that we can pick it up and then come back and uh, and because what what all the panelists want us to be as much interactive as we can. And obviously, right now we're, we're uh, asking each person to give some perspective, but later on we really would uh, want to invite you as the the audience to come in to um, to ask questions and so we can have a very um, uh, open dialogue. Um, so now I'm going to move on to uh, Kathleen um, because. Um, it's very interesting that Mindy, you talked about, you know, uh, a process and playbook, you know, I know that um, in, especially when you are working with the global organizations, uh, it, how do you sustain and scale is so important. And we also know that part of the zero project uh, initiative um, is in collaboration with Valuable 500. So Valuable 500, of course, uh, in many cases are the largest um, corporations in the world, and, um, and that we really have to think about if we really want this um, whole topic of uh, digital inclusion and also people with disability as part of the inclusion be sustained, we really need to think very, very um, broad and then also to think about uh, a programmatic approach. So with that, I'm going to ask uh, Kathleen and Delgado um, who works on special initiatives and also partnership uh, with me at Francis West Co, but um, came from, you know, very much of experience of a large corporation. So Kathleen. Sure, thank you. Yeah, to introduce myself, Kathleen Delgado, um, based here in the United States. And, you know, I've spent my career using technology to elevate brands, you know, in large scale initiatives like the Olympics, Wimbledon and the Masters Golf Tournament and, and really using those platforms to really elevate brands in a different way and creating the ultimate customer experience. Um, we know in the past that, um, you know, some individuals get excluded. So really working and focusing most recently in my career on the accessibility front. And what we're seeing in the clients that we work with is from a marketing perspective, you know, marketing is increasingly becoming an enabler for accessibility within an organization and it's getting elevated. You know, historically it's been a compliance, it's been an HR topic, but more and more we see now, you know, chief marketing officers, they're taking a leadership role in using accessibility as an opportunity to communicate their brand in an authentic way. Um, and, you know, whether it's their their advertising, their website, their video content, their social media, you know, they're now seeing how historically they have been excluding people with disabilities, even if it's unintentional. And they now know, are, they're now more, there's a sense of urgency to really be proactive and look at um, how accessibility can be a core component of their marketing plan. Um, we're seeing great strides in many areas. Certainly we're nowhere near where we want to be, but, um, you know, just this week in the New York Times, there was a whole article about alt text. Um, there's different analysts, you know, predicting, like, for example, I'll put it in the chat, but Forrester made predictions this year that, you know, at least 10 billion, but probably more in design spending will shift to vendors and services that commit to accessibility and it's really accessibility is becoming a business priority. Um, you know, are we there? Not certainly where we want to be, but I think, uh, you know, my contribution in the panel today was if you're within an organization, um, marketing is a great place both internally with employees, you know, if you're having town halls, if you're having internal employee, make sure those events are accessible, but also from an external brand perspective, you know, is your social media accessible? Is your website accessible? Do you have different, uh, are you representing different cultures, different, um, you know, underrepresented individuals? So marketing 
we're finding is just this great spearhead for accessibility and showing um, showing some great progress. And like Mindy said, um, you've got to have a playbook and there's some really good resources out there to really check if you have done what's needed. Um, and um, I'll pass it back to Francis, but just wanted to highlight that, you know, we're seeing great strides in marketing and hoping it continues. Thanks. Yeah, thank, you. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, I think this is actually very um, important to know that um, historically, when we talk about accessibility, like you mentioned, uh, it came from more of a, at least, uh, especially in the United States, it come from the compliance, right, perspective because we have the American Disability Act. And so that kind of casts a long shadow, um, which in the beginning I think was, was, was great because it kind of put accessibility on the map. But in, in the long haul, if you look back, anytime when you use a stick, you know, it's not a very endearing uh, topic. So it's not, um, it's not um, um, to be, it's almost to be expected. That's why a lot of times the C-suite, you know, whether it's a CEO or a CMO or CTO or board members kind of stay away from accessibility as a topic, right? Because they, they, they tend to think, oh, oh my, my gosh, this is a risk management kind of a topic versus a revenue uh, management topic. So, but the, all of us who are on the panel that we, we, we not just uh, think, but we believe and we have seen, it makes a difference uh, actually that if as a corporation, especially large ones, that if you do and you think about accessibility or digital inclusion as really part of your business imperatives, then you can move from a, a risk mentality to a revenue mentality. And also, um, I remember uh, one time I was at a, a, um, uh, a event and somebody said that, you know, accessibility or digital inclusion is really about the three R's. The first R is the rights. You know, we all know the human rights, right? I mean, every person have, you know, a deserve access. The second R is actually reputation. And Kathleen, you mentioned about how company branding uh, creates, you know, reputational impact. And then last but not the least is responsibility, which is, you know, collectively, I think business have a responsibility to deliver um, what they, what they, um, about those the product and services, but also do good for the, for the industry. So uh, for the society. So on that note, I wonder uh, any of you have any kind of, uh, you know, perspective or, or uh, experiencing sharing or combining the, what I call the three R's. Uh, in the business context. Stella, and I'm gonna um, yeah. maybe pick on you. I will start and I love these three R's. And I think as you are, uh, as I was listening to the panel, I started scribbling some of the overarching thoughts from the work environment perspective. And you really gave the framework that is, uh, is helpful to put all of those in adequate containers. So when it comes to rights, right, we all have, the right to work, but the access to it, especially if we have limitations, be that physical, cognitive, or um, just circumstantial limitations, can impede our ability to stay meaningfully employed and have financial security in the long term. So when we think about the adoption, a lot of the technologies nowadays that are starting to codify um, the existing biases in society, it is our right to speak up and influence that design. So one example is uh, selection algorithms or resume parsers, or even job application uh, uh, solutions. And many organizations are now relying on automated interviewing process where you just interact with a bot or you do a video interview that then does analysis of your facial um, movements and then tries to infer whether you're a good candidate or uh, have potential to be successful at that organization without necessarily giving people the ability for alternate options. Because a lot of these algorithms have been trained on uh, existing data that may not necessarily represent today's society needs and may not necessarily be adequate for people who may have facial disfigurements or maybe um, uh, inability to, uh, to, or have an accent or have certain 
things that may not be mainstream uh, part of the design, uh, original design of the solutions. So it is our right to speak up and have alternative uh, channels for us to stay engaged in the, in the labor force. When it comes to the reputation, I think employment brand is huge. And we are in the midst of um, a big shift in the labor market. A lot of people are reassessing their priorities. They are changing their relationship with their organization and what they expect. And we see that translating in mass migration between jobs, massive just exodus of uh, uh, different segments, predominantly women who have to uh, balance the home responsibilities and work responsibilities who demand flexibility uh, in people who are older because they are giving up on um, either trying to find flexible work arrangements or uh, you know, limit, lead, limiting their exposure to unsafe working conditions. So it is a reputational imperative for organizations to not only create that flexibility and provide opportunities for people to engage in whatever capacity they can and want, because that translates into the external brand and that that will impact how other potential candidates will perceive the organization and whether they will want to come and bring their talent uh, to, to that. And then the responsibility, it is absolutely the most important emerging theme when we start looking at um, different disclosures and uh, expectations for human capital uh, reporting requirements. SEC is starting to expect that. A lot of the institutional investors are starting to scrutinize the ESG uh, measurements, especially the, as the social aspect of it, because it is becoming imperative uh, to the business success to have a healthy and vibrant workforce that is being taken care of in the community where they operate, uh, where they live, where they uh, um, have families. And the more organizationally we can think about the entire stakeholder uh, set of stakeholders that are part of the value creation for the organization, the more sustainable the business can become. So I feel like the, the three R's are a perfect way to encapsulate how organizations can respond as well as how they can treat the workers and their work conditions. Well, I'm so glad you call out ESG, uh, in this case, environment and social and uh, governance um, openly because this is actually probably one of the most um, central work that, that my company at Francis West Coast has been working on because I do see that we have an opportunity using the in, um, digital inclusion and accessibility as a way of elevating the discussion and understanding of our C-suite um, executives and, and board members to know that, you know, if you are going to be authentic about your ESG strategy, and like you mentioned, in many cases, at least in the United States, we already, and also I know in UK and Canada, the company are expected to report on their ESG progress. I mean, there's no standards yet, so it's it's a bit of a conf massive confusion out there. But anytime with this op op uh, confusion, there's an opportunity, right? So, so from from our company standpoint, and I think collectively, one of the things we want to do is to use this opportunity of a confusion to elevate the discussion and understanding, and also the processes. And like Mindy mentioned, there is actually ways to be off, to help organization to implement, you know, step process and step change. Again, you don't have to swallow the entire elephant in one, you know, one bite, you know, um, that's when the experience I think um, uh, the panelists have, and then also so for some of us who worked in the big corporations for many years is that you have to be able to um, to, to stare down the elephant and decide where you're going to start, right? And 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 incrementally, but very systematically, and uh, uh, move move that up. So I would love to hear from Mindy or Kathleen or or uh, Fanny. Um, uh, Mindy, go you go ahead on, on your perspective. Yeah, I love that you talked about elevating leaders because when it comes to the third R, the responsibility, I think there's corporate responsibility, but then there's also leadership responsibility, right? You as a leader, you need to be in the right mindset to drive change. 
And before we talked about, you know, unintentional and intentional inclusion, I think one of the things you need to recognize as a leader is that when we move through these cycles of unintentional and intentional inclusion, that's when progress happens, right? It's that movement from the unintentional to the intentional where we're starting to create the infrastructure to sustain changes to organizational culture, whether that's through new policies, through new workplace traditions, new roles, new organizational relationships or new office norms. Like this is a continuous journey. Um, another thing I wanted to, to bring up is tension, right? Having the right mindset when it comes to recognizing tension and friction. Tension is actually a signal, right? That we've transitioned from one state of unintentional to intentional inclusion. It's a good sign. This journey is not easy. It's not straightforward, right? It's something we need to continually work at to be intentional. And to prepare for that, you need to have the right mindset that when you see tension, you're not thinking, oh, something is wrong here and friction is not good, but wow, this is great. And we've reached a point you know, where we have our next launch point so that we can learn from this and make things better for the next person or the next generation. What, what, a, what a beautiful way of, of uh, phrasing it. Yeah, it, it, the, the tension is a good, in, you know, a good intention, right? I mean, that, that you're, like you mentioned, that's actually sign of, signs of change. Um, Fanny or, or Kathleen, do you uh, have any, you know, perspective that you would like to add to this discussion? Uh, sure. I also want to make sure we have time for questions as well. So I'll make a couple of comments and then maybe we open it for questions. But certainly around responsibility, um, marketing is front and center. Um, the one thing I would say is um, sometimes it's not going to be perfect and they will make mistakes. Um, but to keep pushing forward, you know, sometimes from a brand perspective, um, you're really called out now for making a mistake. But I think... Um, there will be some failures, but I think from a responsibility perspective, they just have to keep moving forward. Yeah, I think one way to mitigate that is um, earlier on, I was in a couple of sessions and the phrase uh, many of you are familiar with nothing about us without us is, you know, having people with a, you know, with a di diversity background experience or ability really be part of your, um, your, um, team. I, I, I know that uh, when we were at IBM, one of our um, uh, colleagues who's now with uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, Jim Sanaki, is in uh, IBM corporate communications. So he really um, helped us to understand what language or what message is appropriate. Uh, it's subtle, but it's very important. So again, going back to Mindy's point, uh, leaders needs to be, um, be aware and not just to be aware, but really taking action to ensure that when you when you go out and put a, a statement, whether it's accessibility statement or inclusion statement out there, you really back it up, you know, with resources, with talent, you know, with policy and governance, um, so that it's 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 genuine, you know. Um, I wonder, Fanny, uh, based on your work, both your academic work and your um, your client work, uh, any, uh, anything to add to it? And then we're gonna open up for some questions. Sounds good. Uh, so just to tie it all back together, compliance is important. You should do what you have to do, but the key is how to create inclusive cultures and accessible cultures inside an organization. And that comes from the leadership to the values of the brand. Like, what do we care about? Uh, how do we create inclusive cultures? How do we work in a way where empathy and the awareness of others is part of the values every day? How do we do working sessions and meetings that are inclusive and that it's okay to have uncomfortable moments and not run away? Um, how to be comfortable with uncertainty and with um, being um, sort of you know, uncomfortable with situations that really you push things forward. And then going back to the ESGs, and it's fantastic that ESGs have become such a prevalent emerging metric. How do we see beyond the numbers? Because there's really humans and there are stories and lives that are being changed thanks to measuring ESGs. So it's always bring, bringing back the human to the brand, to the way we work, to the way we interact with customers, to the way we interact with each other. Yeah, this is um, absolutely going back to the foundation of what we talked about 
even in our description of our session is that it, this is an art, right? It's not a science. This is not a black and white. Even though from the from the beginning, if you if you take a compliance perspective, then it's going to be you you are complying, you are not complying. There is nothing in between. But I think what what you're all saying is that in order to be really authentic, we need to move beyond that. And if we move beyond that, then you're going to have different shades of gray. And then and but that's when the opportunity, the uncomfortable uncomfortableness, is actually offer an opportunity for creation or um, of innovation in this case. So um, I'm going to open up and, and to the audience, if, if there's any question that you have an opportunity to ask any of these uh, expert panelists uh, right now, uh, feel free to just unmute and, and speak up. I see Mark's mic is off. I don't know whether it's by accident or, uh, <laughs> but if you have a question, please, uh, please, you know, go ahead. I, I guess not, but um, if you if you want to, you can also put a question in the chat box, you know, and we'll pick it up that way. Um, if not, then we're going to, um, um, you know, ask you again to see if you have come up with a different word uh, from the beginning of our session after you, you know, heard the panelists and, you know, kind of shared their perspective, if there is a different word that comes to, to your mind. Um, in the meantime, we're going to um, um, keep, you know, um, discussing the, the, art, the art form of, uh, of inclusion. So as you look out and as you work on some of the, uh, your projects, you know, um, today, are there one or two things that you think that in this case, right now we're sitting and emerging from the pandemic, right? That there is supposedly a, a, a new star, but, but there are also, there is a lot of changes, whether it's geopolitical changes, whether there is financial changes. So as an individual in a company, let's say you are the inclusion, you know, a leader, um, or you are the uh, accessibility uh, uh, program managers, so what are one or two things that you think that you could be um, advising or giving uh, as your quote unquote, your um, um, recommendation to make this topic, you know, visible and relevant to the executives uh, on up? I can start. And from a workplace perspective, I think one of the most effective ways to create that sense of inclusion is by listening to the employees. There is a, a whole new set of analytical tools that are coming to the world of work where you can do social listening, you can do uh, organizational network analysis and use technology, even, even if it's just a basic survey to understand what are the employees feeling? What do they expect? How are they uh, engaged? And I think, uh, technology is there, it's really about adopting uh, that mindset of continuous listening uh, and then taking action as a result of that because employees know what gets in their way. Employees know what motivates them and just creating the opportunities for them to express that in itself is gonna create a very uh, different sense of belonging and um, respect for the organization and uh, commitment to support the organizational mission. The other important part in tying back to some of the earlier comments about the leader's responsibility is to tie some of the employee sentiment and outcomes of the, the workplace uh, measurements to the leadership behaviors, right? If, if you see a significant attrition in the organization, is that because the, the leadership is not role modeling certain behaviors or they are prioritizing business results over the worker experience or other stakeholders engaged um, uh, in, in the organizational ecosystem. So again, thinking a little bit more holistically about the impact and then looking at the employee journey and saying, what is the earliest intervention point where we can make a positive impact that then results in that better customer satisfaction or um, more uh, less attrition or 
uh, better business outcomes and bottom line results. So it's it's converting it on the side and then putting these listening points along that end-to-end -end journey. I, I, I'm so glad you mentioned listening. I think you you all know I have like this the four L model in my my head, which is you listen and you learn, right? And then then you 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 lead. You don't 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 try to lead without listening and learn first. And then you you live, right? I mean, live the experience. Um, we do have a question uh, coming in, uh, I think from uh, Eliana, I, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, it says, how do you keep marketing from co-opting accessibility and just using it as a savvy lever for making more sales? That's a great question. And, and we do see that. I think um, the answer is you, you have to be authentic in, in what you do because it's, um, it's very obvious, even more so to generations now coming, if you're not authentic and it's just, um, you know, slapping on a Band-Aid. And so I would say um, you have to really be authentic, meaning it has to be part of your strategic plan, your marketing plan. It has to be the CMO going to the leadership team in something that would ultimately show up in your annual report. Um, it has to be where marketing within an organization where accessibility team is connecting with design. So there's definitely operational elements within an organization that make it more authentic. Um, that would be my and I, I will I will add to that in this case, maybe the stick approach can help in that and we have seen companies who are just putting the band-aid or the facade and so to speak. But with social media, as, as every person can challenge and can call out an organization for not being authentic. Um, and that's, that's the minimum I mean, a person can do. But at least for a country like, um, like United States, and we also know, for example, in Canada, you have a, Can a Canadian uh, Accessibility Act. Uh, European Union has uh, their uh, 376 Act. So there could be even more actions such as lawsuits can be levied against a company. You know, we all heard about the famous target lawsuits. We also know a lot of banks, for example, in the United States has been uh, uh, sued before. I'm one person is not, never want to lead with a stick and, or compliance, but in this case, some of the um, marketing executive actually are not aware what the potential risk. That's why we talked about before, there is risk, there's a rice, there's a human rights risk that one could um, potentially accidentally, unintentionally, um, you know, um, commit. And so it's part of our job. And that's why sessions like Zero Project is, is, is very important that give an opportunity to really broadcast the, um, the messaging. Uh, to them because they sometimes they don't know what they don't know. You know, I don't necessarily think that they're doing intentionally once they realize the consequences. Yeah, um, comment, uh, other comment? Yeah, I, I wanted to add something that sometimes um, the, the accessibility, you know, the fear of getting sued or because it's a law, it's, the, it's some people's introduction to, to accessibility and inclusion which is fine as long as they learn from it. So if we follow Francis's four L's and we listen and we learn the impact that that is having on your employees and it's having on your customers. And if you care about your business, it's okay if you start there as long as it starts trickling and impacting the other areas. Because as an organization, if your only inclusive effort or accessibility effort is in one slice of the pie, it will not impact your business it's gonna be a, an effort that it's gonna go halfway. You, you will not get you where you need to go because that's not how things work. So as long as you leverage it and you learn from it and then you see how you can really include it in, in your operations in every aspect. Um, but it's, it is hard to fight that. But if people are smart business people, they should learn from it. Yeah, I think this is one of the, actually one of the reason we have this session, right? I mean, we can, 
accessibility and digital inclusion can stay compliant, which is where we came from. Um, but in order to sustain, to make the real impact, we got to move it over to the revenue side, meaning to the business side. So uh, all of us, you know, really needing to, in this case, perhaps learn a new, um, new knowledge, right? Collectively to articulate the business value proposition to our executives so we can continue to get the uh, support. Again, this is an emerging topic. Uh, I, I can say for sure that because I've been in sales and marketing all my life. And uh, when I see this uh, 10, 15 years ago, I thought we, we can move the dial a lot faster. But on the other hand, like Stella, you talked about, we're talking about moving a culture, right? The historical culture of accessibility or digital inclusion or a people with disability has been not even on the agenda, on the business agenda. So, so one really have to have a very long view and not get frustrated. Uh, I mean, if you don't do get frustrated, at least we have each other uh, to, to lean on. And that's the beauty of you know, the, the uh, setting like we have right now. Um, we are actually uh, coming close um, to the end. Uh, any other uh, comment or um, a question, please uh, feel free to, um, to put in there. And also, I'm going to uh, uh, go around and ask one more um, question to, um, you know, we, we use the fr uh, phrase reframe and inclusion. Uh, I would love to have each of the panelists to talk about, you know, in your mind, you know, what does reframe mean to you from your uh, particular point of view? I'll go first. And the company name uh, that I, I found it is called Reframe Work. So in my mind, the way we can reframe inclusion and create an inclusive work environment is to um, rethink how work gets defined and organized and how the workers, not employees, because the, the world, the word workers in itself, it's more inclusive than just employees, um, can perform that work and what the work environment needs to be to create that uh, most optimal uh, uh, match between the work and workers. The opportunity for HR is to really create that inclusive environment for workers so they can know what it's like because only then they will be able to deliver to the customers and um, uh, satisfy, delight, uh, create inclusive products, uh, inclusive brands, uh, marketing plans, et cetera, and truly be authentic. I can go next. For me, um, in the design process, the way that I like to reframe, I mean, to me, reframing is looking at things through a different lens or a different perspective. So always invite someone different than you, at least one, to help you through creating your brand, your experience, uh, and any, any initiative, ideally more than one, but if at least you can have, surround yourself with people that are different uh, in terms of abilities, background, um, and that should get you there. Yeah, I would, this is Kathleen, I was, that mine was very similar. My reframe is with the pandemic and with how much remote work has changed, we have this opportunity to have accesses to so many different people with different life's experiences, different perspectives. And we as brands, as companies, as organizations have such an opportunity to diverse our workforce, diverse our perspectives. And um, it's a huge opportunity. And for me, when it comes to reframing inclusion, something that I always advocate for is thinking about radical inclusion, right? How do we see inclusion everywhere and not just define it as compliance, to see it in how we express our brands, how we, you know, bring, how we engage with people in meetings, how we design our products, everything. Um, and I think when we start to see how every opportunity is an opportunity to be inclusive and to be more connected, that's when we really reframe how we think about inclusion. Well, I absolutely um, um, thank you all for uh, uh, giving your perspective. If, if the one takeaway from this session is that um, we are at a, a point in time or point in history, you know, coming out of pandemic, there is a huge opportunity in front of us. 
or by very confusing. And it could be very messy. Um, and like uh, Mindy said, you know, when there's messiness, you know, when they're like uncomfortableness, that's when things could change. And that's when the opportunity actually could be in front of us. And I think collectively, um, we, we ab absolutely could put disability inclusion and digital inclusion as the common theme, because I always say there's two things, age and ability, you know, are, are, you just cannot get away from it. You know, every human, whether you are a woman, men, you know, a gay, lesbian, whatever, other inclusion category, this one thing that's common is that we will age and when you age, you're gonna acquire disabilities. So from that standpoint, we have a platform now that uh, is highly visible because thanks in a way, thanks to pandemic, you know, it recognizes the shortcoming of a human being that we cannot travel, that we are actually vulnerable to, to, uh, to, um, to uh, things like uh, COVID. And, uh, and so putting human first and redesigning this uh, will be an opportunity to, to really raise, um, raise the floor, so to speak. Um, each of my panelists um, have a, a, a robust you know, LinkedIn profile. Fanny just uh, mentioned that um, she has a podcast that you all should check out. By the way, uh, Kathleen and I wrote a uh, primer uh, for ILO under the United Nations ILO um, uh, publication, which is uh, Leave No One Offline. It's a primer to help you, the audience, to really communicate and also advocate digital inclusion in your organization. So you can check it out and perhaps that can serve as a, a way of a, a starting the conversation with your senior executives because it is designed to help to elevate again uh, the the topic from risk management or compliance over to the business side as a revenue uh, business imperatives. So I want to thank you all for coming to our session today. I know you have many choices today, and the Zero Project has done a tremendous job, you know, organizing very very uh, interesting topics. So we thank you for that. Before you leave, if you don't mind, if you can leave one word like. Um, uh, we said before, you know, after listening to this panel, uh, that will give us a little glimpse into um, your thinking, and that will actually help us to prepare uh, for our future, you know, um, uh, events like this. And also, if you think that uh, there's particular topic or point of view that you would like to discuss further, we are all on LinkedIn uh, and on Twitter. It's very easy to follow and contact us. So uh, feel free because uh, we are here to, to really to enable, to empower all of you to move on uh, to the next, you know, to the next milestone or next uh, level, which is elevate this whole conversation to the uh, higher C-suite and also to, the, uh, the, to become a business imperatives. So with that, I again, thank you very much and uh, Please um, take a chance to, to, to uh, leave a word, and then um, I guess we can uh, call it a wrap. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Francis. Thank you all for joining Enjoy us. Enjoy the rest of the conference.